Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, send it to me. Uh, Box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives. And become one of our friends on Facebook. Facebook.com slash Radio Detectives. And uh, follow us on uh, Twitter at Radio Detectives. Well, before we do get started, I want to encourage you, as you make your travel plans, remember, JohnnyDollarAir.com. JohnnyDollarAir.com is a Prosline affiliate. So you get all the benefits of going through Prosline in terms of naming your own price on hotels, rental cars, airline tickets, and even more. But part of your purchase price goes to support the great detectives of old-time radio, at no additional cost to you. Uh, remember, when making your travel plans, check johnnydollarair.com first. Well, now it's time for today's episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, and we're going to kind of get into this episode a little bit suddenly just because of the recording. The original air date, April the 5th of 1959, and the title is The Frisco Fire Matter. Johnny Dollar. Yeah. What? Who's that? Smokey. Smokey? Smokey Sullivan? Yeah. Holy... Do you always call people at 5.30 in the morning? Oh, hi, you, Smokey. How are things down in New York? I'm living out here in Frisco now. Oh? You know about the big fire out here? Now, Smokey, don't tell me you've been up to your old tricks. You know I wouldn't do nothing like that, Johnny, after the good way you've been treating me. Well, I hope not. But what about this fire? Big warehouse. They're in San Francisco. The Barnwell Warehouse. It's still burning. Arson? Yeah. I know who did it. There must be insurance in a big warehouse. Yeah. So as soon as I can check it out, I'll... Uh... Look, where will I find you? Where will you stay, Johnny? Uh, let's see. At the Huntington Hotel up on Knob Hill. Me? In a nice place like that? Oh, unless I know where to call you. It's okay, Johnny. I'll call you. And you're sure it's arson? I'm sure. And I'll see you. <laughs> Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. A handcuffed thief makes a desperate bid to escape a frantic dope addict, crashes through a fiberboard wall at the police station house. It's part of the daily routine in New York's 16th police precinct, Hell's Kitchen. In the new issue of Look magazine, you'll follow tough, dedicated cops as they track down the man who pulled the trigger, run down a burglar, subdue a drug addict. And you'll learn in Look the kind of guy it takes to make a detective, what he thinks about his job, what he thinks about the kinds of people he has to deal with. It's all here in Look's exciting picture story, Detectives at Work, an uphill fight in a tough city where the crime rate has risen almost 10% in the last year, where 40% of the nation's drug addicts fight, steal, or beg for a fix where an entire neighborhood suddenly becomes silent when the police department tries to track the man behind the gun. You'll see it all in Look Magazine's dramatic picture story, Detectives at Work. It's in the latest issue of Look, and it's on your newsstands now. Get your copy of Look today. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Greater Southwest Insurance Company, San Francisco office. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Frisco fire matter. First of all, I had to make sure my expenses to the West Coast wouldn't have to come out of my own pocket. So expense account item one ten cents for a call that got Pat McCracken of Universal Adjustment Bureau out of his bed. I asked him to dig up some facts and figures for me in a hurry. Within 20 minutes, he called me back. Johnny Dollar. Well, Johnny, I've been on the phone to San Francisco ever since you called me. You were right. About the big fire. Yeah. How did you find out about it? Well, never mind that, Pat. Just keep talking. Uh, Well, it's a warehouse. It's owned and operated by Mr. Peter H. Barnwell. And he has an office at 1427 Camac Street. 1427 Camac. Got it. And the insurance. 340000 Wow. Carried by Greater Southwest Insurance Company. 
All right, if I hurry, I can just make plane connections. No, wait a minute, Thanks, Johnny. Pat, thanks a lot. <laughs> Item two, 20188, plane fare, Hartford to New York to San Francisco. And believe me, those jet flights on American get you there in a hurry. I left New York at 8 a.m. and pulled into San Francisco before noon. Pacific time, of course. Item three, a dime for a newspaper at the airport. Apparently, the fire had burned itself out. Item 4, 675, taxi to Peter H. Barnwell's office on Kamak Street. The reception room was jammed. No. No, there's no point in sending anybody over here because he won't see them. Now. Listen, chick, I'll get you tickets for any show in town if you just... No. I tell you, he won't see any of you. Not even me? No. Now, why don't you reporters just go back to your papers and wait until Mr. Barnwell's ready to talk to you? My card, miss. It's no use, mister. Will you read it, please? But he doesn't want to see any reporters, right? Oh. Yeah. Uh, just a minute, Mr. Dollar. Now, how do you rate that, buddy? What paper are you from? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, uh, Bigville Bugle. Huh? Yeah, that's out near Bum Spung, Oklahoma. Oh, now, look, wise guy. Look. Mr. Dollar. Mr. Dollar. Dollar. Will you come in, please, Mr. Dollar? Sure. Thanks. Now, wait a minute. Did you, Johnny Dollar, the insurance is right in here, sir. Thanks. Hey, wait a minute. Sit down, Mr. Dollar. Make yourself at home. Well, I must say you weren't at all upset about the loss of your warehouse. Should I be? Sit down. Sure. Mr. Dollar, that building's been a losing proposition for years. Because of its bad location, because of zoning restrictions, and the cost of tearing it down. <laughs> I've done nothing but lose money on it. Oh. But I've been very careful to keep up the insurance. So, now that it's gone up in flames, I shall at long last collect on it. $340,000. That's right. And with whatever I can get from some other misguided investor with the land itself, I'll be sitting pretty. I see. Now, don't get any funny ideas, Mr. Investigator. The police have found nothing whatsoever to suggest arson. Nor will they. You sound pretty sure of that. I'm sure of it. Even if it were a job that you didn't have done? I'm sure of it. You know something, Mr. Barnwell? I'm not. So if you can be of any help in putting through my Did claim... Did you hear what I said? I heard, Mr. Dollar. Doesn't worry me a bit. Hey, fellas! My car filter may be worth a thousand bucks. How's that? Heard over the radio that the people who make pram filters have a big treasure hunt on. So I check my oil and air filter. And I'll be doggone if there wasn't a specially marked pram air filter that might pay me a thousand dollars. No kidding. My service station man said whatever I win, he'll win the same amount. Told me a regular filter check is important to today's cars. So important that Fram Corporation is paying $60,000 to get car owners to check their filters now. Cash money? Sure. This is Fram's silver anniversary. Last year, 10,000 secretly numbered Fram filters were distributed all over the United States and installed in cars during regular servicing. Every one of them is worth cash. Some as much as $1,000. Why, one of you guys may have one in your car and not even know it. Say, what are we waiting for? Let's get those filters checked. <laughs> Hurry, folks. Get in on the big Fram treasure hunt. You could win up to $1,000 in cash. Check your car filters now. And now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Frisco Fire Matter. Expense account item five, two bucks for a taxi. In my opinion, Peter H. Barnwell has the warehouse fire set. But opinions don't count in my business. You've got to have proof. And I hadn't yet got together with my informant, Smokey Sullivan. Smokey, once a clever arsonist himself. Later, a counterfeiter, bootlegger, just about everything in the book. But from the time he helped me with a case a couple of years ago, he'd stayed on the straight and narrow. And of course, I've always paid him well for his help. Before going on to my hotel, I stopped in to see Bill Mullen of the arson squad. Yeah, the papers say you're in town, Johnny. Glad to see you. Yeah, how are you, Bill? But there's no reason for you to be here about that fire. Well, that's so... We've already found out how it started. How, oh, Bill? Some old derelict, name of Stumpy Moran. 
He used to sleep there every night. Had an old iron bed and a little sort of shack on one side of that warehouse. Yeah. So last night, like a lot of the darn fools all over the country every night, he went to bed loaded and lit a cigarette. Result? No more mattress, no more shack, no more warehouse. What, are you holding him? Also, no more Stumpy Moran. He died in the fire? Yep. And you're sure that's how it started? Johnny, when you've combed through evidence on as many cases like that as I have, there's no mistaking it. But now, Bill, listen. All suppose... the way from the source of the blaze to the empty bottle. The carbonized paper from the cigarette. The foil from the cigarette package. The hair from the mattress. A thousand and one little things that the ordinary person wouldn't even think to look for. So listen. Yeah? Be a nice guy and call off the papers, will you? Why? Because they saw you over in Barnwell's office, they've decided it was arson, and they're calling us a bunch of bums. The only reason they do it is to make headlines. So call them up and tell them to lay off, will you? Set them straight. Not until I'm sure they aren't right, Bill. Huh? Now, wait a minute. What's that mean? I'll see you later. Item six, another taxi to the hotel hunting it up on Knob Hill. I went straight to my room and sat down to wait for Smokey Solomon to call. I didn't have to wait long. Smokey? Yeah? Well, I hear they found out how that fire started. Stumpy? Yeah, that's right, Stumpy Moran. He was a friend of mine. Not much brains, Johnny, but a nice old guy. But Johnny? Yeah? He didn't do it. But they found all the evidence. He'd been drinking and smoking in bed. He never touched a drop, Johnny. You sure? He didn't smoke, neither. I know. He was my pal. Where are you, Smokey? You know where the Hungry Angel is? Uh, the cocktail bar over on the... That's right. Take the alley and back. I'm in the phone booth at the end of it. I'll be waiting for you. Okay. Now, listen. Yeah? Do you know who did set that fire? Yeah. The only guy in the whole country who could leave no trace. Wait a minute. And they won't even question him because he's been living straight for so long. Touchy Thompson. Yeah. Lives in a nice house on Aldea Drive, 527. But he ain't there. How do you know? A note on his door says, gone fishing. You're absolutely sure it was he? I'm the only one knew where to look for his sign around that fire, and I found it there. I'll show it to you. Proof, huh? Yes, sir, Johnny. I can prove that warehouse was set by... Oh, no. Smokey. Smokey! <laughs> Sociable, up-to-date, debonair. What's this, a new word game? No, I'm just mentioning the qualities that people admire in other people. Oh, I see. If you're sociable, up-to-date, and uh, what was that other word, debonair? Yes, debonair. But listen to it this way. are serving Pepsi-Cola these days. It's the up-to-date refreshment. Be sociable. Serve Pepsi. In the alley behind the Hungry Angel, I found a couple of policemen carefully going over every inch of the phone booth where Smokey called me. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Conroy heard the shots and came running back here. You get the angle of that bullet, old Conroy? Hey, listen, listen. What about Smokey? City hospital, but he isn't going to live, Dollar. Not a chance. And you have no idea who shot him? No. But you're a smart dick. Why don't you find out for it? All right, now look. And let me tell you something else, too, Dollar. If that warehouse fire had been a torch job, which it wasn't, like you're blabbing it out to all the papers, your dear pal Smokey Sullivan is the only one who could have done it. So his being knocked off is good riddance. Why Smokey? Because we got every other firebug in this town nailed down. That's why. Want to bet? Uh, Mr. Dollar, I honestly don't understand it, considering the way one of those bullets nicked his heart. But it looks as though that man Sullivan will live. Now, the point is, Doctor, can I talk to him? Well, you can try, of course. Oh, this way, Mr. Dollar. 
But he was not able to give anything to the police who just left. Now listen, Doctor. Do everything you can for him, will you? I'll foot the bill. Oh, very well. Right in here. Okay. You, uh, mind if I talk to him alone? If you like. And, uh, if you can. Thanks. Smokey. Uh, Smokey. Hi, Johnny. Oh, hi. Yeah, the, the, the doc says you're going to be okay. Yeah. Can't get rid of me. Attaboy, Smokey. Uh, I didn't talk to the cops. Just looked at them like I was dead. Ah, good for you. Hey, Smokey, did you see who put the slugs into you? No, Johnny. But it must have been Touchy. Touchy Thompson. Same as he set that fire. Yeah. All right, now listen. You're in no shape to go over there and show me. But if the arson squad found no trace, and believe me, they know everything to look for. Chemicals. What? Touchy had chemicals. Special chemicals. Never left a trace. Everything leaves a trace of some kind. <sighs> no. He had to use a gas mask. That's what must have knocked out Stumpy Moran. Then Touchy could plant the liquor, the cigarettes. Then I guess the only thing I can do is try to find Touchy Thompson. Johnny. Yeah? If you do, Johnny, be careful. Yeah. Yeah. Act four of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. Rambler station wagons lead all but two other makes in sales. Repeat, Rambler station wagons now lead all but two other makes. Car registration figures prove it. Never before has any station wagon scored such a sweeping success in so short a time. Why the nationwide swing to Rambler? Well, listen to this. If you want America's lowest price station wagon, Rambler has it. If you want big six-passenger room, plus America's easiest parking, Rambler has that. Most miles per gallon? Rambler has that, too. Trade-in value? Rambler has the highest of any low-priced car. Yes, Rambler is America's top economy station wagon. But Rambler is also the compact quality car. The only car to offer personalized comfort, including front seats that glide back and forward separately, adjustable headrests, reclining seat backs, finest air conditioning at lowest cost, deep-dip rust-proofing, Yes, all America is discovering that Rambler station wagons are different, and Americans love that difference. So will you. Drive a Rambler station wagon now, 6 or V8, at Rambler Dealers. And now, Act 4 of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account item 7, 5, 20 more taxi fares. There was nobody home at Touchy Thompson's place. Only the note on the door Smokey had told me about, gone fishing. Fishing, huh? He was probably hiding somewhere around the town, waiting for the atmosphere to clear. But how to bring him out in the open? Then I suddenly remembered an old friend of mine, Maury Webster, head man at station KCBS. I'd have made a dollar even for a cab to the Sheraton Palace and the KCBS studios. Johnny, this is a pleasant surprise, although I had heard you're in town. How are you, Maury? Up to my neck. We're in the midst of a big celebration. You know, our 50th anniversary. Oh, Yes, sir. We were the first broadcasting station in the country, and we're kind of proud of it. Well, I should think you would be. Let me add my congratulations. Well, thank you, Johnny. And what brings you here? Maury, when is your next news broadcast? Mm-hmm. Well, let me see. Well, Don Mosley will hit the air in just about seven minutes. That'll just give me time to knock out a news item for him to read on the air. Oh, what kind? I'll tell you while I'm scribbling it, if you don't mind. Well, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Hey, Maury... I have a sneaking suspicion it'll flush out an arsonist. Oh? Yeah. And kill her. As briefly as possible, I told Maury Webster my plan, the why of it. I handed him the news item I'd cooked up. He penciled in a couple of minor changes. Then gave it to his top man on the news bureau, Don Mosley. A few minutes later, there in his office, we listened to it being broadcast over the powerful facilities of KCBS. On the local scene, well, it took insurance investigator Johnny Dollar to clear up the matter of the Barnwell Warehouse fire. Here it comes. Yeah. Dollar has proved conclusively that it was set by an old hand at that business named Smokey Sullivan. His reason? To kill another man by the name of Moran, whose body was later found buried in the embers. 
Incidentally, Sullivan himself has just died as a result of bullet wounds, no doubt inflicted by some friend of Moran's who sought to avenge his murder. Well, as for the holdup that occurred early this morning on the Embarcadero... Well, I hope it does the trick, Johnny. What are you going to do now? Maury, there's going to be a stakeout at the home of one John R. Thompson, formerly known as Touchy Thompson, out on Aldea Drive. Oh, then you're turning this whole thing over to the police. That stakeout will be me. But if Thompson did set that fire and kill Moran... I still it? have to prove it. Well, don't you think it's a little dangerous, Johnny? Could be. Well, in just a minute... Thanks, Maury. Thanks a lot. So I went out to Aldea Drive again, and I parked myself rather uncomfortably behind a hedge across the street from Thompson's place. Finally, it must have been around 10 p.m., an expensive car pulled up, and a man loaded with fishing gear went into the house. I waited a couple of minutes, and then I went over, knocked on the door, walked in, introduced myself, and laid a few cards right on the table. Are you crazy, Dollar? Didn't even know about that fire until you told me just now. Why lie about it, Touchy? Look, I've been fishing. Yeah, for what? An alibi? Oh, give me that, the trout. Look, look, look here. Here they are. Yeah, trout. Ever see a nicer mess of them? Pick them up at any market. Not me. All right, who was with you? I was alone. I was over there camping beside the lake all the time. My sleeping bag still out in the car. What lake? Mono Lake. It's a little over 200 miles east of here. Yeah, I know it well. Uh, well, that's why I caught him. I know it well enough to know that because of the high mineral content of that water, no trout could ever survive in it. What? Oh, well, look, wait a minute. It's wait. no good, Touchy, and with the proof I have that only you could have set that fire with some of your fancy chemicals. What do you know about that? No, uh, you got you got no proof. Look. Perhaps he has, Touchy. Oh. Oh. Well, I'm glad to see you two know each other. Very smart, weren't you, Touchy? What do you mean? I mean the way you fell for that phony news broadcast and came back here. Phony? And Dollar, thanks for setting the stage for me. Yeah? What does that mean? You came here because you suspected Touchy. You had a big argument. You both pulled your guns and uh, killed each other. No, no. Wait a minute. Wait, That's wait. the only conclusion the police can possibly reach when they find your buddies lying there. Look. No. Nope. Don't make a single move, Dollar. Neither of you will do anything because five seconds from now you'll both be dead. What are you wrong? What? Pull that trigger, of barn willing. It's the last thing you'll ever do. Bill. Climb in this window, boys, and take care of you. Uh, uh, there isn't any need for violence, officer. That's right, Barnwell, there isn't. All right, all right. You two come. Well, Johnny, now just what under the sun ever led you to come out here, Bill? Your old friend Smokey Sullivan called me to the hospital. He was a little worried about you. You mind? Mind? You've got to be kidding. <laughs> Yeah, they were both in it up to their ears. Each, in trying to defend himself, just put the other in there much deeper. And by the time the courts get through with them, they'll be sorry they ever lived. Expense account total, including the trip back to Hartford and a good hefty gratuity for Smokey Sullivan, plus all his hospital bills, $923.91. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Star will return in just a moment. <laughs> I'm a mean little kid. And are you pleased with yourself? Sure, because I'm a germ, a bathroom germ. Bathrooms is where the meanest germs get to live. <laughs> Do I have fun causing odor and spreading disease? Well, you better watch out, son, or your landlady may find out about Lysol brand disinfectant. Lysol? Oh, no, Lysol. That's what I said. Lysol. Well, anyway, a lot of women are finding that a dash of Lysol in their cleaning suds every week wipes out nasty bathroom disease germs like you, disinfects from one cleaning to the next as no other product can, wipes out many deadly viruses, too. Lysol makes every cleaner work better. It's the easy, modern way to get bathrooms really clean and free of odors. Lysol can do that? Mm, and what's more, now besides regular Lysol, there's a new sweet-smelling pine-scented Lysol. And they're both out to get you. Hey, was you ever a mean little kid? One more remark like that and I'll open this bottle of Lysol. Help! Now, here's our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, a quiet little ranch in Oklahoma. 
quiet, that is, until the shooting starts. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood and is written, produced, and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in our cast were Virginia Gregg, Vic Perrin, Larry Dobkin, Alan Reed, Gil Stratton Jr., Paul Duboff, Bartlett Robinson, Don Mosley, and Tony Barrett. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Dan Coverly speaking. This is the CBS Radio Network. This is Andrea J. Graham, author of the Web Surfer series. Oh, and a man's wife. You're listening to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. Welcome back. Well, this one's really neat for the way that they uh, worked in KCBS and actual details about it. Now, there is some debate as to whether KCBS was the first radio station to go on the air, but it definitely opened in 1909 and uh, overall just a very solid episode. All right, well, that will do it for now. Reminder... Next Thursday, Boston Blackie. And then on Friday, of course, yours truly, Johnny Dollar. And coming up tomorrow, it'll be Dragnet. But in the meanwhile, send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook. Facebook.